I remember when I was in seventh grade and I attended my first youth rally. It's just an event where a bunch of high school kids would come together and worship, have a bunch of fun activities. And I remember this one speaker. It was uh, the first time I, I ever heard this type of speaking before, growing up to where I grew up at least. And essentially the speaker uh, talked to us and he kind of brought us into a story. And it was this. He was just like us, just one of those kids in the youth group, super involved. In fact, he might have been even a little better than us. A young kid like me probably aspired to be just like him because, well, he was kind of the key youth leader and had got to do a bunch of leadership stuff. He was a great, he had a great singing voice. He had a great presentation voice. He was handsome. He was tall. In high school, he was a great athlete and all this kind of stuff he was sharing. And then something happened where um, drugs and all these other types of life events kind of made his life spiral out of control, where eventually nobody would trust him, the church um, and him just couldn't connect, and his life hit rock bottom from going to prison, a whole nine yards. And then he shares the story where he says, in one moment— in one moment, he found Jesus. And his life in that moment completely changed, turned upside down, a 180, and from there on out, he was saved. And there was these tears in the room, and, and well, probably not teenage boys, but a lot of crying, right? And, and I remember thinking, I remember getting excited, and, and he was just so passionate, and I was just in awe of him. And that was one emotion I felt, was, was a sense of passion. And I'll be completely honest with you, the other emotion I felt, I was kind of uncomfortable. Partly because I'd never heard this story before. And the other part, honestly, can it be that easy? Really? Really? Having a, a relationship with Jesus, finding Christ, is it that easy? Walter Scott, he's this um, old traveling evangelist connected with Churches of Christ. And while working as an evangelist for the Mahoning Baptist Association between 1827 and 1830, he developed this exercise and so he would uh, go into these towns and these cities on his horseback as he would preach the gospel. And every time when he first gets into the community, he would try to find a, a group of children. So maybe there's some kids running around. I don't know if they threw footballs in 1827, but they're having a good time throwing sticks or rocks at each other. I don't know what kids did back then. But he would gather them together. And he would have this exercise. And he would say, hey, kids, raise up your hands. Raise them up. And so what he was trying to do is he was trying to figure out how do we create a, a message that is accessible, that is understanding for kids. And so he says, okay, raise up your hands and, le and let's do this, kids. And he, so he would, he, would, he would do five things. He would say faith, repentance, baptism, remission of sins, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so Walter Scott developed what he called the five-finger exercise. Eventually, it caught on, and if you know anything about the history of Churches of Christ, it later emerged as the five steps of salvation, um, which is a little different than the original one, which was faith, repentance, baptism, remission of sins, and gift of Holy Spirit. Walter Scott, the reason why he was sharing this message was he was trying to invite children into the story of Jesus to make it accessible even to children. Is it really that easy? Is the story of Jesus that easy? If you read deeper about the Pharisees, they were considered heroes among the Jewish community. The Pharisees in many ways were responsible for making Judaism relevant in the first century. The Pharisees, for example, refused to submit to the Roman Empire and their culture around them. They had strong, strong support from the common people of Israel. They would have listened 
to the Pharisees in any manner, especially if it meant crucifying some random guy who preached something else. So why were they key agitators? Why were they opponents in the ministry of Jesus Christ? Well, I think there's lots of reasons why, but I, I, I want to share with you one this morning. And I'm going to visit some passages with you. Mark 7, the Pharisees and scribes, experts in Moses' teachings and Torah, who had come from Jerusalem, they gathered around Jesus. They noticed that some of the disciples were unclean because they ate without, without washing their hands. That is gross, by the way. So the Pharisees and experts asked, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with impure and defiled hands? John 9, they brought into the Pharisee the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was Sabbath day, and when Jesus made the mud and opened the eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him, how, this guy, how did he receive sight? Like, how can you see? He said to them, well, Jesus, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed it, now I can see. But some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. For he does not observe Sabbath. Matthew chapter 22 has lots of passages or questions and a lot, but a couple questions where the Pharisees are trying to trick Jesus. And so here's one of the questions they ask. Is it lawful? Not lawful as in legal requirement, but is it lawful spiritually according to Torah? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Teacher, they ask, one of my favorite questions in all of Scripture. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Which one? Paul, one of the greatest, one of the most faithful, one of the most inspiring and charismatic Pharisees, leans in and begins wondering what to say to this Ephesus church. A church that he has such great confidence and hope in. And so this is what he says. He says, you were dead. You were disobedient. You were hopeless. But God, who is rich in mercy and out of great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, he made us alive together in Jesus Christ. There is so much good, so much good about existence of long-standing religious traditions and rituals and institutions like Churches of Christ. We have key beliefs and practices that make us unique and give us confidence that we are faithful to God. But we also know that we have some demons and skeletons in our closet, right? Similar to the Pharisees, we often overcomplicate what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We can. We can overcomplicate it. I'm guilty of it. If you ever had a question with me about scripture and theology, in about three minutes you'll be lost. The good news is you leave my office in three minutes so I can get to work, right? <laughs> There's a, a ploy there. Just kidding. How we read and interpret particular issues in scripture how we identify ourselves politically, socially, in what ways are we ma maintaining the correct and right path of God. All of these somehow have its way in we understanding what our identity is as Christian. What happens is we begin to overburden ourselves and we regrettably forget what's the core of our identity. For example, of course, of course, dietary restrictions and eating bacon and circumcision, those are no big deal to us. Absolutely not. But you have to understand, for the first century Jewish Christian, they were unwilling to yield, which led to exclusion of people hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. There is nothing wrong with having set beliefs, practices, and doctrines. Absolutely not. But we need to think carefully on the ways we think about these areas. For example, I think we often believe that our faith and our practices and our beliefs and how we do things, all these things, 
what they do is they help us try to understand more and try to know about who Jesus is. Okay, so we, we do these practices, we think this way, because we think if we do these things, then that's going to give us a better understanding of Jesus. Okay, make sense? I'm wondering, though, if maybe Jesus, how we know Jesus actually informs our sets, our, our practices, and our beliefs, right? So meaning, Jesus becomes our identifying marker than all of the other particulars, our beliefs, our practices, our doctrine, our teaching, all those other things flow out of that. Does that make sense? So there's two ways to look at it. How are you going to allow yourself to be identified as a follower of Jesus, and then that is going to inform how you practice and believe, or are you going to have all these practices and beliefs and allow that to inform how you believe about Jesus? The Ephesians church is getting established. And so Paul wants to know what words should he impart upon them. He's in prison. He's on trial. He'd be put to death soon. I don't think he's necessarily worried about church bulletins or assembly times. They already have probably at Ephesus a certain way of doing things. They already have in place certain leaders. They've become a church at this point. So what words does Paul impart with them as they continue on this journey of being a church family? It breaks my heart. It absolutely breaks my heart when I hear and read about articles or, or research that seem so negative towards established churches like our own. In fact, if you know me, I get a little defensive. But the truth is, the truth is, many folks, including our own, Children and loved ones are leaving churches in mass numbers. There's, there's no way to deny that. Some are simply just looking for other churches or other alternative forms of faith. Some of us stay in here even wrestling, though, why we stay in here because we feel loyal and committed, but even ourselves are struggling. Is this really how to do church? And one of the reasons I believe folks are leaving church and Christianity is because of this. Maybe they're just thinking about this question, and that is, why do people make everything so difficult? Why do people make things so complicating? For example, worship. Is worship really that complicated? Worship is about getting a glimpse of God every week together. It's about inviting the Spirit of God to transform our hearts and to move into a deeper understanding and relationship with Jesus Christ. That's worship. All right, I got to pick on my church elders. Church elders are not hired CEOs voted to maximize shareholder returns. Sorry, guys. I love you elders, but in many ways, you're like us. You are flawed human beings. The difference is, you are flawed people called to help other flawed people be drawn closer to Jesus Christ. And the list goes on. You see, Paul grabs this Ephesus church by the shoulders, and he looks them straight in the eyes. And he says, remember, remember what you are supposed to be all about. Remember, remember that you are with Christ. Remember that you are part of a rescue story, and that Jesus saves you. Remember those testimonies where somebody gets up and, and shares with maybe youth or anybody and says, look, I was, I was lost. But then I was found. I had an old life that was leading to death and destruction. But because of the power of Christ, I found new life. I was resurrected. And now because of that, I am saved by Jesus Christ. You were dead, obedient to sin, and the desires of flesh, aimless and hopeless children of wrath. But God, who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead through our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. 
And so it is by grace we are saved, not by anything that we have done. And so right in their eyes, straight in their eyes, Paul looks and dares them, dares them to believe in the radical and simple message of salvation in Jesus Christ. So this morning I look you straight in the eyes and I dare you, I dare you to believe in the radical, the radical and simple message of salvation in Jesus Christ. A minister tells a story about a part-time staff member at a church who had been walking out in the neighborhood and was simply just handing out pamphlets about an event that was coming up in church. And this part-time staff member, he had been mugged and he was stabbed in the heart. He was rushed to the hospital to ICU with really no hope for survival. And the, when the word spread among the church staff and to the church, prayers were being lifted up all throughout the community. And the minister shares a story that, as usual, each person offered sincere prayers and what he called mild petitions. Give comfort, for example, or give hope. But the person sharing the story also describes that many of the prayers somewhat reflected that the victim had already faced certain death and peril. Then another prayed. And he says it was the most athletic prayer that ever was witnessed. And this person wrestled and shouted at God. Jab in the air, body shaking, the prayer said, you've got to save him. You just can't let him die. You've done it for others. You've done it for me. Now I'm begging you, I'm begging you to do it again. Do it for him. Save him, Lord. When everyone else heard this prayer, they just knew, they knew that God would indeed come to heal. And in the face of that desperate cry for help, that man was saved. I know in my own life there has been times where I have fallen on my knees, desperately crying out to God to save me. Save me from this pain. Save me from this sickness. Save me from this loss. Folks, the core of our identity, what we are all about, is we participate in a rescue story that Jesus saves. And so I say to God this morning, thank you, God, for saving us. Thank you for giving us a new life in Jesus Christ. Last week... One more thing I want to share. Last week I brought up how I'm afraid of heights. Here's another one for you. I'm a terrible carpenter. So you're probably wondering, what are you good at? <laughs> or you think I desperately need a hobby. Both are true. Coming up is Canaan's Boy Scout Pinewood Derby. If you've been in Boy Scouts, you know how big of a deal that is for at least dads. Kids are welcome to participate. In the past, Canaan did a lot of work, but he also got a lot, a lot of outside help to make sure that his Pinewood car was really fast. This year, though, our plans are that Canaan, a little bit with my help, is going to build his own Pinewood Derby. Father and son, out in the garage, wood chips, sawdust, and Band-Aid wrappers flying everywhere. So why will this be the best year yet for the Pinewood Derby for Canaan? Because it's his own. He owns this car. It's his work. It's his workmanship. And he can't wait for all the world to see it. Ephesians chapter 2.10 For we are what God has made us. Maybe a little flawed, not as fast afraid of heights, but we are created in Christ Jesus for good works for which God prepared beforehand to be a way of life. We are God's workmanship. 
for the world to see. You see, you're not alive to simply enjoy God's grace. You have been created again as God's masterpiece for two purposes. To show that we belong to God and what God can do through Jesus Christ, and then to serve a human need in engaging God's work, which reflects God's grace and love and mercy in Jesus Christ. You see, you've been rescued. Jesus saved you. You are now God's, his workmanship for the world to see. I find it so important to know that Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 10, it was considered a baptism text for many in the early Christian movement. It was read to those who were going to commit their lives to Jesus Christ in baptism. And so this morning, here's my invitation, it's for all of us, to either for the first time claim or to reclaim that we are part of the rescue story that God has invited us in, not because of what we have done, but because of the grace of God that's found in Jesus Christ.